Okay, welcome to Cardiovascular Pharmacology 1. Uh, we're going to do a hemodynamics review or an overview first, and then we'll talk about diuretics, uh, the RAS system or the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and then calcium channel blocking agents. So let's start off with the cardiovascular system and just an overview of what we have going on. So the first thing is, is what is the responsibility of the cardiovascular system. So we want to distribute and transport these nu nutrients and oxygens to the tissues, but we also want to get rid of waste uh, and get them out of the body. And then there's homeostasis. So homeostasis is really just keeping things normal. Stasis means to stay in one place. Uh, so thermoregulation, immune system distribution, hormone communication. All of these things are the responsibility of the cardiovascular system. So what are the components of this system? So the first is the pump or the heart, and then obviously it circulates blood through the system, and then it has these three levels of vessels. So we have the distribution vessels with the arteries, uh, the exchange vessels with the capillaries, and we'll see how, uh, depending on what area of the body we're in, those uh, are more or less important, and then collection vessels, which are the veins. And it's important to know where the blood is distributed and, and what quantities. So when we're talking about the pulmonary system, only a very small amount of the blood is in the pulmonary system. And it's not as much of a pressure system either because it's just not that far from the heart. The lungs and the heart are right next to each other. 7% of the time or 7% of that uh, blood distribution is in the heart. And then 84% uh, is throughout the body. So in a 70 kilo male, you're talking about 5.6 liters, something like that, of circulating blood. And then what is the blood made of? So there are three large components or, or main components, the white blood cells and platelets, the white blood cells usually helping with uh, immune function, platelets helping if there's some kind of injury or bleed. Uh, the red blood cells oxygenating and then the plasma as well there's not a ton of math that we go over but this is one important equation and it's more important really to understand it rather than numerically but understand what's going on so the cardiac output or the rate of blood blood flow out of the heart is equal to the heart rate times the stroke volume so let's take each of those in turn so cardiac output, how much blood flow is getting out of the heart? If there's just a little bit of blood flow, then we don't oxygenate enough. And if there's too much, uh, then uh, we might be trying to make up for some issues other places where uh, the body's just not getting enough oxygen. The heart rate, uh, there's a couple of ways to control that, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. But just think about it this way if you increase the heart rate you're going to get more oxygenation as you go and then if you decrease the heart rate you're going to get a little bit less so there are some times when you're running or doing something active you want to have a higher heart rate and then there are times when you want it lower stroke volume is another component which is each time the heart pumps how much volume is actually getting out in each heartbeat and sometimes when the heart rate is too high it just doesn't have time to fill and if it doesn't have time to fill, then it's very inefficient. So sometimes we'll use medications that will actually slow down the heart, allow it to fill properly, and that will actually create a better cardiac output. So there are a number of factors that we uh, talk about. And we start with coupling factors and cardiac factors. Uh, the coupling factors, uh, we begin with preload. So how much blood is in the left ventricle before the contraction? And then afterload is the squeeze required to push the blood into the aorta. And it has to be a lot of pressure uh, to get it all the way through the body. The cardiac factors include myocardial contraction. So how powerful does it contract? And we sometimes forget that the heart is a muscle because we think of muscles as maybe your bicep, which when you move your arm, that's when you use it. But your heart is pumping all day, every single day. And the second part, heart rate, how fast uh, that squeeze is. And all of this adds up to uh, the cardiac output. So when we're talking again about preload, 
we're filling the ventricles before the contraction and then with the afterload we're seeing well how much pressure does it take to get the blood into the systemic circulation and some factors that can affect this for example if someone is fluid overloaded then there's it's going to take a lot more pressure to get into that space uh, than if there isn't when we think of blood pressure arterial blood pressure uh, we again divide into um, systolic pressure uh, versus diastolic pressure and that's really what is going to cause this you know blood pressure cuff to uh, take the measurement so systolic on the top diastolic on the bottom so you see as you pump through uh, the blood goes out and we go systolic diastolic uh, and then we get the blood flow uh, diuretic agents so let's first talk about the processes involved then we'll make a map of the nephron that hopefully will help you learn this spatially the kidney function is divided into three different processes there's filtration where you clean things out filter the fluids you resorb it so maintaining the balance uh, don't keeping from losing those electrolytes and then secreting or removing metabolic waste. And a lot of times when we think of kidneys, we're just thinking of getting rid of the urine, getting rid of the waste, but really there are three major processes. The nephron, and that's what this is, it's a picture of the nephron going from the glomerulus on, and we're gonna call the glomerulus in the top left. You have millions of nephrons in your kidney. Uh, so again, this is huge blown up out of scale, but you start with the glomerulus and what's important is that you have the afferent arteriole and then the efferent arteriole and capillaries in between and that's really unusual because generally you say artery capillary vein in this case by having a high pressure system that means that if something is a bit closer to the glomerulus then there's going to be more diuresis and if it's further there's going to be less so let's first get the map of the tubule transport system, starting with the proximal convoluted tubule or the PCT. Just as if someone is in close proximity to you, that means it's close to you or proximal. We go down the loop of Henle, then up the thick ascending limb, uh, and that's where uh, one of our most common diuretic furosemide works. We get to the distal convoluted tubule, just again, the word distant means far, so it's far from the glomerulus and then the collecting tubule and collecting duct. But let's overlay this with some pressures, water permeability to better understand uh, how this works. So we have a very high water permeability or a diuretic effect starting with the glomerulus uh, and going into the proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, then when we go into uh, the loop of Henle, we again, we're still pretty high. Uh, as we get to the distal convoluted tubule, not as much. And then it's a bit variable when you get to the collecting tubule. What we want to do is we want to replace these very high, high, low, and variable with drug names. So mannitol, which is here at the proximal convoluted tubule, or the PCT, is the one that's going to have the most diuresis. And we use this when we're talking about something like uh, intracranial pressure. Uh, furosemide uh, is the loop of Henle, and that's something we're talking about, like CHF, congestive heart failure, HCTZ, maybe some blood pressure issues, triamterene and spironolactone, really more valuable for maintaining potassium than they are for anything else. So when we look at mannitol, we're expanding the systemic plasma volume, forcing the kidneys to filter a lot faster. Uh, and then sodium and water are not resorbed in the PCT. The urine volume increases and really reducing intracranial pressure, that's the one of the issues, but also reducing intraocular pressure. On the adverse drug reaction side, we have headache, nausea, vomiting, electrolyte imbalances, dehydration, but usually this is some kind of medical emergency that you'd have to use something like osmotrol. Talking about furosemide or Lasix, we're preventing sodium from being resorbed in the loop of Henle. The water follows the sodium and causes increased urine formation. We're really talking about maybe pulmonary edema or other edemas uh, that we would have throughout the body. Sometimes congestive heart failure you know, is a cause. 
adverse drug reaction so hypokalemia we lose potassium electrolyte imbalances so I mentioned the potassium but also magnesium and then ototoxicity where we might have some issues uh, with hearing the thiazide diuretics hydrochlorothiazide brand microzide they prevent sodium from being resorbed into the distal convoluted tubule uh, water follows sodium and causes this increased urine formation and so some of the indications we'd have would be hypertension someone just becomes hypertensive they might use hydrochlorothiazide or heart failure and then adverse drug reactions just like furosemide we lose potassium so hypokalemia uh, potassium magnesium and then uh, in some cases increased cholesterol levels the next one are the potassium sparing diuretics so spironolactone brand aldactone uh, this aldosterone antagonist if you think a little bit about what aldosterone does it helps you better know what spironolactone does so aldosterone normally causes sodium and water to be retained and body holds on to it and if you hold on to sodium and water you increase blood pressure and that's what the body wants to do if the blood pressure is too low but if spironolactone is blocking aldosterone now we release the sodium and water and now we decrease blood pressure but again while the indications are hypertension, heart failure, hyperaldosteronism, what we really are trying to do is often hold on to potassium to counteract either furosemide or hydrochlorothiazide's hypokalemic effect. Uh, adverse drug reactions, so hyperkalemia, gynecomastia, metabolic acidosis, uh, those are some of the adverse drug reactions. Okay. Uh, the potassium sparing diuretics uh, move on to triamterene, which is often paired with hydrochlorothiazide as a combination. So triamterene blocks sodium resorption in the collecting duct and the distal convoluted tubule. Water again follows sodium into the urine. So we would see this with hypertension and edema, but again, compared to furosemide, uh, hydrochlorothiazide is certainly nowhere near the amount of diuresis. Uh, adverse drug reactions include hyperkalemia and then certainly electrolyte imbalances. But now we're going the other way, just as with spironolactone, we're holding on to the potassium rather than getting rid of it. Uh, next slide is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, or the RAS system, taking the R, the A, the A, and the S. And we'll talk about a few medications here. So the RAS system is meant to maintain fluid and salt in the body, regulate the blood pressure, and there are two main enzymes that are involved and it'll be critical in understanding how the medications work and knowing how this very straightforward RAS system works. So angiotensinogen goes through renin and when we think of an enzyme we usually think we're going to see an ACE and a lot of times you can have an IN at the end instead of the ASE and that's what um, renin is it's an enzyme that gets angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 and it's a response to low arterial pressure low sodium where the body's saying hey our blood pressure is a bit too low we need to raise it please release renin the enzyme and once that enzyme goes out then angiotensin 1 forms and we have to go through one more step and that next step is the angiotensin converting enzyme which we call ACE so once ACE gets in there, we get to angiotensin 2. So we've gone from angiotensin 1 uh, from the liver to angiotensin or angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 does two important things. It promotes sodium and water resorption, but it also maintains constriction of the arteries. Both things are going to increase blood pressure, which is what we want. But if you have someone who's hypertensive and you want to lower their blood pressure, well, uh, we're going to want to block some of these pathways or some of these steps. ACE inhibitors or ACEIs are going to block at the angiotensin converting enzyme step. And the angiotensin II receptor blockers are going to block at the receptor uh, bypassing the enzyme. And these two ways of doing it are really helpful. So let's talk about the ACE inhibitors versus the ARBs. So the ACE inhibitors like enalapril and lisinopril, so enalapril is brand Vasotec, lisinopril is brand Zestril. Uh, both of these end with pril, that's a common suffix. 
and they stop the angiotensin converting enzyme. It prevents the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So we don't get that salt and sodium and water retention. We don't get that vasoconstriction, hopefully lowering, lowering blood pressure. So the indications include hypertension and heart failure. Adverse drug reactions, we can see hypotensin, dry cough, hyperkalemia. Uh, so again, we want to be mindful. For example, if we're giving a diuretic and that diuretic causes hyperkalemia, we can make the condition even worse. Uh, this dry cough is not something that you treat. Rather, you discontinue the ACE inhibitor and you would go to the ARB, which is in the next slide. So an ARB, or angiotensin II receptor blocker, uh, we're going to first go over the three examples, Losartan, which is Kozar, Omasartan, which is Benicar, and Valsartan, which is Diovan. So we see the sartan ending and that again, or suffix, and that again helps us know that these are ARBs. Uh, we prevent angiotensin II from binding to sites on kidneys and arteries uh, that causes vasodilation and prevents sodium reabsorption. Indications again are hypertension and heart failure and adverse drug reactions can include hypotension where we take their blood pressure too low and hyperkalemia, again, just like the ACEI. Here's a caveat. There's no dry cough adverse drug reaction, so we may need to switch a patient from an ACE to an ARB if this presents. Uh, they should not be used together because the outcomes are no better and we can cause renal impairment as well. Calcium blockers or calcium channel blockers, we'll go over the two major classes. So the first class is, well, let's start with what calcium does. Calcium, we need it for smooth muscle contraction. And the vasculature, the blood vessels, use calcium for vasoconstriction. So if we block the calcium from entering the smooth muscles, it causes vasodilation or opening of the vessels. The heart uses calcium for regulating the timing of the contraction. So if we block calcium in the heart, we can help reduce arrhythmias. But let's look at the two different categories. And we use a, a very formal chemical class. It's either a non-dihydropyridine or a dihydropyridine. So the non-dihydropyridine is what we'll start with. Diltiazem, brancardizem, verapamil, brancalin. Uh, these block the calcium channels in the heart and blood vessels. They're used most commonly for dysrhythmias and indications include hypertension, angina pectoris, cardiac dysrhythmias. And we'll see that that's going to be missing from the next group of calcium channel blockers, those cardiac dysrhythmias. Adverse drug reactions, constipation, bradycardia, and why are those? So the first, constipation, because again, just like with the muscles, uh, your body, when it's trying to uh, use the GI system, also uses calcium. And if you take block that calcium, it makes it harder for the GI system to do its job and get things out of the body. Bradycardia is on the other end where instead of just lowering heart rate a little bit, maybe we reduce heart rate a bit too much uh, and we make the patient bradycardic. The other group of calcium channel blockers are the dihydropyridine. So amlodipine, which is brand Norvasc, nifedipine, which is brand Procardia. You notice that the pine ending, a lot of people say, oh, that's a dip in blood pressure is a way to remember it. So we block the calcium channels in the blood vessels. There's no heart activity, so there's no using these for dysrhythmias. And it's most commonly for hypertension. But again, we see the hypertension in angina pectoris as two of the indications, uh, but we don't see, and I'll go back to that slide, uh, the cardiac dysrhythmias uh, that we did with the non-dihydropyridines. Adverse drug reactions, we could get some peripheral edema, again, we're vasodilating, and we could get some headache, again, from that vasodilation.